She was the Docker's daughter who became a huge star with a personality and voice no one could match. I think Scylla was the most prominent solo singer to come out of Liverpool from the 60s. In a 50-year career, she topped the charts, dazzled on stage and dominated our television screens. The Scylla television show um, broke, broke rules. Do you know who I am? No, have a guess. Didn't you used to work in the sweet shop? But in what was then a man's world, how did a young woman from the rough side of Liverpool confound expectations and become such a huge success? First time I saw Scylla live, she had no stagecraft, she couldn't talk to an audience. I thought, well, this girl, you know, she's a one-day wonder. Blow me, was I wrong? From singing alone in her living room to entertaining millions every week. Surprise, surprise, it's Scylla here. I mean, Scylla fronted two of the biggest shows on television. This is the remarkable story of how one woman's passion, determination and talent took her to the very top of British entertainment until she decided it was time to leave the stage. The way Scylla Black resigned on air was an absolute masterstroke. <gasps> I couldn't believe. I'd never seen anybody do that before. We unearth never before broadcast footage. Have we got any fellas that are willing and able? And hear from those who knew her best. We'd get in about 10 and Cilla would have a glass of champagne. Would I have one? No, I would. I'd wait for a little while. <laughs> I was lucky to know her. As we reveal the real Cilla. Once described as the greatest TV presenter of all time, Scylla Black was one of the nation's most influential entertainers. But how it all began for this self-proclaimed Mrs. Show Business, then known as Priscilla Maria Veronica White, was anything but glamorous. Uh, Scylla started life in a sort of working class family, Liverpool, very kind of wartime, post-war upbringing. I'm a Scouser born and bred on Scotty Road, yeah. you know, next door to a Chinese laundry, and I live behind a barber shop, and we never, ever had a front door. Very community orientated, we're all in this together type uh, attitude that everyone took. So I didn't know I was poor because everybody else was in the same boat. But out of hardship and challenge would come some of Scylla's most important qualities. As Father John struggled to find work as a docker, she saw in her mum Priscilla a steely determination to do whatever was required to succeed. There was a lot of striking, so my mother sold second-hand clothes in a market, yeah. so she was very much her own uh, person, yeah. and very much, you know, often or not, the breadwinner of the family. Yeah. Scylla's confidence came uh, from watching her mother cope on the stalls, I mean, in the sense that she could talk back to anybody who gave her a piece of their mind, she could give it back twice as much. And I think Scylla saw that, you know, women were not to be downgraded and she could speak up for themselves. The quick wit, and that stayed with her right through, because it worked on later years on television. Scylla wasn't just inspired by those she spent time with at home. My mother used to take me, oh, just to, to escape, um, maybe two, maybe three times a week to the films. And it was fantastic to see people like Doris Day and Natalie Wood talking about their backyard. And it was like five acres of green grass and all these lovely trees and flowers. And our backyard was where the outside loo was and where we kept the coal, you know. So, I mean, yes, I did want I want I wanted a little bit of that, you know. She wanted to step up from the stalls in the cinema and step into the screen. Still, I, would, I said later on in, in later life that she very much had um, uh, champagne in her blood, in the sense of stardom in her blood. Stardom and talent. Scylla's ability and passion for music became apparent from a young age, inherited from her harmonica playing dad and a mother who loved to sing. There would be so much singing around at that time because people, you know, be somebody in the street will have had a piano and therefore whenever sort of two or three families got together, the piano would be played. So there was music in these houses. How confident when you were, were you when you were a little top that you'd be famous? I mean... Oh, I think you've got to be a little bit confident, Alan. You know, I started singing when I was about three years old. And when the pubs let out on a Saturday night, my dad used to come back, it was jazz out at our house. And I'd heard them all singing. 
and I'd get up, oh, it must have been about 11 o'clock at night, and I'd sit on the back stairs, and I could hear them all do turns, and then someone spotted me, and they said, oh, get little Scylla up, little Scylla, and stood, because my mother's name is Scylla as well, stood me on the kitchen table, and I sang, and I got that first round of applause, and I wanted <laughs> to do, I've been doing it ever since. That need, if that was the word, for, um, you know, to people to know her and to like her, uh, was there from the very beginning. Scylla now had a taste for performing, and as she grew up, would practice singing around the flat. And she loved one particular front room where her voice sounded as though it was blasting out. But later on, when they, suddenly they, they went up market and got a bathroom indoors, uh, she started going in and sort of bouncing her voice off the porcelain. When she was 16, she got the chance to swap the bathroom mirror for her first opportunity to sing in public. We'd go to all these clubs and we got friendly with the boys. And one night, uh, one member of a group came down from the stage and passed me a hand mic to sing, just for a giggle. He didn't know I sang. So I said, well, all right, mate, I'll show you. And I just continued where he left off. And it all happened from there. Her first gig gave Scylla two things, a taste for stardom and a belief she could succeed. Every weekend I'd come home, you know, after singing in a club in Liverpool, I'd come home and say, Mum, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be famous. And never once, my mum or my dad said, oh, yeah, yeah. Never patronised me in any way and gave me all the encouragement. But Scylla still had a long way to go if she was going to make it. She was so awkward, I thought this is going to be a very short-lived career. Blow me, was I wrong. The start of the 60s saw Scylla singing more and more in public as she tried to turn her hobby into a career, and she was in the perfect city to do it. Liverpool was the centre of the entertainment music world. The young singer performed under the stage name Swinging Priscilla with local bands including Jerry and the Pacemakers. Showing the same determination and resilience she'd seen in her parents, the 17-year-old not only held down a full-time job as a typist, but also took a lunchtime job as a hat check girl at the Cavern Club. Scylla was now at the heart of the burgeoning Mersey Beat movement. If you're in the cavern, doesn't matter which bit of the cavern you're in, uh, it's an underground cellar, and so you can hear and feel and see the sweat running down the walls. So even if you were working in the cloakroom, you'd still be right at the centre of something quite serious that was happening. She also got herself an evening job as a waitress at the famous Zodiac Club, where she met a young man who would become the love of her life. When Scylla first met Bobby Willis, she thought he was a Scandinavian sailor, because he had the sort of blonde hair and he'd been on holiday, a sort of 40 quid for two weeks in Benidorm. First time I met him was when, well, I thought he had money. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did. I thought he had money because he was had white blonde hair and a suntan. I thought he's off one of the boats, you know, off the docks. He's, he's, he's Norwegian. And I said to my girlfriend, God, we're on here. He did lie to me. Did he? Yeah, he said he had Spunny his own down. bakery. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. And he worked in Woolies. <laughs> but I was smitten by then. Scylla became Bobby's girl, uh, you know, when they were teenagers. And that never changed in their lifetime. They were never apart for even one night for all their time together. What I saw always was the fact that they were a dedicated couple, dedicated to each other, but also dedicated to what she was doing on stage. With Bobby by her side, Scylla was now starting to get noticed. And as her performances improved, she found herself in the best musical company. You came up with the Beatles, of course, and you must have, legendary figures now, you must have known them all pretty intimately, didn't you? Well, I did. I've seen them in their underpants, yeah. <laughs> what she meant was not that she had affairs with them, but that she uh, had been in changing rooms with them for many, many years. The Beatles were the ones that championed Scylla and introduced her to Brian Epstein, who managed them. 
Brian Epstein came on the scene and sort of paved the way with the Beatles. And then that's when he might have been talking to John saying, you know, I've got all these fellas like Jerry and the Pacemakers. Do you know of any girls would do all right? And you probably said, well, there's only one, the Scylla. And that's probably how I was discovered in yeah. a way. But Epstein initially wasn't sure. Scylla's first audition for him, Singing Summertime, didn't impress. I actually did my audition with the Beatles and Brian turned me down first off. Did he? Oh yes, I was not very good. I was too nervous. And plus the fact I was singing in the Beatles key. You know, fellas do sing diff in different keys than girls. After the audition, Scylla was back to waiting tables, at least for a while. And it wasn't until, oh, nine months later after the Beatles that I was in a club called the Blue Angel singing um, Bye Bye Blackbird. I didn't know he was in the audience and he was, he liked me. The rest was history. But before Epstein could sign the young Liverpudlian, he had to convince her father he was up to the job. He was very protective of me and he turned down everyone until Brian Epstein came along. And you know, the only reason why he signed, because I was under 21, because he, your dad had to sign your contract, is because we'd bought a piano from his parents' store 12 years before, <laughs> and it was still going strong. <laughs> With Epstein now managing her, Scylla's life was about to change, and so was her name. She was written about in the very first edition of Mersey Beat, uh, which was put together to reflect this burgeoning music scene that was happening in Liverpool by Bill Harry. And so he knew that her name was something like Scylla and then a colour. Was it white? Was it black? He couldn't remember. He had to put this first new edition of the magazine out, and so he put black. Epstein preferred the new name, and Scylla agreed to change it. It was a sign of her trust in a man who would become her friend as well as manager. In this rare Panorama interview, she discusses their relationship. Scylla, do you think you could have got to the top without Brian Epstein? No, I don't think so. Why not? Um, because I came from Liverpool. <laughs> well, at the time, nobody wanted to know anything about Liverpoolians until Brian Epstein came on the scene. I mean, it was a bit of an handi un handicap to anybody who did come from Liverpool because of the way they spoke. How's it changed you? Um, I think you'd have to ask my parents and people who know me because I can't see any change. But I know one thing, I'm more temperamental now. <laughs> <laughs> Epstein sent her down to London where she worked immediately with the hottest producer of the day, George Martin. George offered Scylla a recording contract. In four weeks, she had gone from 20-year-old typist to signed recording artist. It was all a long way from Scotty Road. Scylla's first single just made the top 40, but her second was a big hit. Anyone Who Had a Heart was released on the 31st of January 1964. It sold 800,000 copies and made Scylla the first female singer in two years to reach number one. Anyone who ever dreamed could look at me and know I dream of you. It's such an amazing song and I think the way that she sang it was so special. And every time you listen to the recording, it really, do, it really does get you. Scylla had a very unique singing voice. There was the soft voice and there was the hard voice. And so when she sang, anyone who had a heart, that it was really soft. Could look at me and know that I love you. Very soft. And then going into the bridge, knowing I love you so. And then it was almost opera. Scylla was the most prominent solo singer to come out of Liverpool from the 60s. Most prolific in, in hit records and unique sound. I bought her records. She was a good picker of songs uh, to sing uh, with that very distinctive voice and style of hers. She had, she had an extraordinary voice. Around this time, her partner Bobby, who had musical ambitions of his own, was also offered a recording contract. But Scylla wasn't keen on the idea. She made it quite clear that she didn't, wasn't happy with that. Now that is quite something, the man you love, 
to say, no, you can't be a singer. It must have been a, quite a strain, you know, to be to told something. She was strong. She was not a stupid little girl from Liverpool. She was a strong woman from Liverpool who knew what she wanted and how to get it in the nicest possible way. Scylla followed up her first number one with a second, You're My World. If you could believe it, by the age of 21, Scylla had two number one singles. That's an astonishing achievement. To do it by the age of 30 would be impressive, but to do it by the age of 21 almost defies belief. From Liverpool, the young lady that captivated everyone's heart. In fact, anyone who had a heart, that is. And that is Scylla Black. You're my world, you're every breath. She just walked out with this grace and confidence and she looked the audience in the eyes and she was completely in control at 21 to be, you know, performing under those circumstances. Just incredible. It was even more incredible when you consider how hard she'd had to work to make it look so easy. Just six months earlier, her performance at a famous London venue had been very different. First time I saw Scylla live, we did a big summer show at the London Palladium. And she was so awkward, it's hard to believe now. She couldn't walk on the stage. I mean, it was just a nightmare. And Bob Nesbitt, the producer, had the brilliant idea of building a little platform out over the pit. So all she had to do was to, the curtains opened and she walked three steps forward, stood on the platform and never had to leave it. But she had no stagecraft, she couldn't talk to an audience, it was hopeless. But I thought, well, this girl, you know, she's a one day wonder. This is, this is never going to last. She's got, she's got a wonderful voice, but this is going to be a very short lived career. Blow me, was I wrong. In 1966, Scylla released one of her most iconic songs, written by Bert Bacharach and Hal David. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now I'd like to sing a song that you made very lucky for me. And it's about one of my favourite boyfriends. What's it all about? Alfie. What's it all about? Alfie. Oh, I mean... It's a heck of a song to sing. It's really difficult to sing, but she does it with such a plum. I love that song. Apart from anyone who had a heart, I'd say that was my favourite to sing. It's such it's such a random song. Like it goes all over the place, and you wouldn't think that it would make such a beautiful song, but it's it's amazing. And yeah, it's it's Scylla. It's so Scylla that song. She had a really tough time recording that because Bert Bacharach made her do it over and over and over and she was getting really really frustrated What's it all about when you that frustration was captured on camera during the recording of the hit song I kept saying again 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 and we sort of reenacted that moment in the show um, so yeah i think she was getting getting to the end of her end of her rope by the by the time they finally got the recording but yeah it's such an iconic recording she knew what she was capable of. There's a film of her being directed by Burt Bacharach, and that it's quite telling, I think. And you know, uh, I mean, he was, he knew what he was talking about, but she also knew what she was talking about. Can you relax everything? Because she knew herself better than anybody. Scylla's determination was already apparent, and it would help her become the biggest selling female artist of the 60s but her world was about to be blown apart. Scylla was devastated. She said later, I didn't really take it in at first. By 1967, Scylla Black was the UK's best-selling female artist. Now a millionaire, she and her partner Bobby were living in the heart of London's swinging West End. But the man who'd helped make it all possible, her trusted friend and manager, Brian Epstein, was about to disappear from her life. On the 27th of August, he was found dead at his Belgravia home. He was 32. Still, I was devastated by the death of Brian Epstein. He's a young man, early 30s. Just to pick up the newspapers, it was, you know, plastered and 
uh, all over the headlines. She said later, I mean, she, I didn't really take it in at first. It seemed like a, it just didn't seem possible. It seemed an impossibility. And she kept trying to f telephone him, um, ask him what he thought about this or about that. And that went on for quite a long time after his death. Epstein had been key in helping Scylla plan her career. And next to his body, a contract was found for a new project they'd been discussing, Scylla's very own television show. It was a typically canny move by Scylla. She knew that at that stage, pop stars had a really limited shelf life. So she realized that telly would give her much more longevity. Scylla wanted to recast herself in the role of TV star and got the opportunity after impressing BBC's head of light entertainment, Bill Cotton. Billy Cotton Jr. had the, the great faith in me, you know, to put me on there, saying, perhaps saying to me, you know, you're going to be the first girl to have a show of this type, you're going to make history. The Scylla Show first aired on the 30th of January 1968 and was an instant success, regularly pulling in up to 22 million viewers. Television really is a marvellous thing, you know. I mean, you just think where we'd be without it. I mean, we'd all be sitting at home now, looking into that empty corner and thinking, I wonder what we could put over there. She was only 25 when she did her first series in 1968. She went on to do eight series for BBC One and was a complete natural. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, with this being a live show, you know, going out at this moment to millions of people, everybody's always asking me in case I get nervous. They say to me, do you ever get nervous? Well, the truth is, no, I never get nervous. I'm just too terrified to be nervous. I was really interested how a woman would front a show like that. And, but she was brilliant. Scylla on television was a phenomena. Audiences that can only be fantasized about today. Don't you clap a long time? It's lovely though, don't stop. Her success was, was instant. As well as singing and presenting, Scylla used her Saturday night variety show as an opportunity to showcase her comedy talents. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Top of the Form. David, what is the name we give to the meat we get from pigs? Uh, pork. Good, that's two marks to you, David. Doing the Scylla show on BBC One on Saturday night uh, showed that she could do patter, she could do comedy. There's nothing she couldn't do, and she had a lot of confidence. She totally inspired me. I mean, I wanted to have my own TV show and do sketches, which I later went on to do, which was nice. She made you feel that a northern accent and a sense of humour, they were important ingredients for television. <laughs> well, thank you, Tim, and the two Grahams. We'd be seeing like, oh, what am I doing? I'm getting carried away. <laughs> People don't realise how hard it is to be yourself and talk to an audience, either through a, through a camera uh, or on the stage. That is a gift. She has an extraordinary warmth. I mean, she's very British. Um, it's a very sort of British characteristic. Um, and I think that that warmth is something that came through really with, with everything that she did. It was quite incredible, really, because she was, she was such a pioneer um, of women presenters having their own show. But she was also a singer and she was an entertainer and she was funny. So she'd do sketches with famous comedians. Do you enjoy doing this with me? Yeah. <laughs> People really hadn't seen an artist like that before, you know, fooling around with famous comedians. She was a natural at doing that. And then she'd sing a song. Step inside, love, let me find you a place. And of course, that was written by Paul McCartney. And I remember thinking what a beautiful song it was and the way it made you feel. When she started singing it, you felt she was in the lounge with you, you know, Scylla's with you. She would look into camera and pull you into her, into her world. It was like an invitation in that you would be happy that we were happy to take. You see, that's where she was very special because the public felt that they knew Scylla. She was part of their household. The Scylla television show um, broke, broke rules. Really. The format before had been very stymied in the sense that you a variety show had a singer, a clown, uh, a juggling act, 
and a dancing act. And that was about it. There was a format. And then there was Scylla uh, jumping around, going out of the studio. You know, the man in the street became part of one of the stars of the show. And the funnier the reaction, the, the bigger the laugh, the more popular the show. Uh, what's your grandson's name? Uh, Peter Anthony Black. Peter Anthony Black? Yeah. Well, what a coincidence. Do you know who I am? No. Have a guess. Didn't you used to work in the sweet shop? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my used to work in Planet. Not Myra. No, it's a singer, you twit. <laughs> She's a precursor, really, of the Anton Deck of today, of Michael McIntyre, of, of engaging with the public and making them part of the entertainment. Scylla had managed to successfully reinvent herself from pop princess to TV presenter and had reinvented Saturday Night TV. As the show's popularity soared and transitioned into color, Scylla's confidence grew too as she proved she wasn't afraid to tackle the important issues of the day. Do you think women should be just as equal as men? Well, there is a possible chance they could be. <laughs> what about women, equality in women and everything, women's live? Uh, not really, no. No, they haven't got the brain. They haven't got the brain <laughs> capacity. Oh, no. girls! No, I don't think so. No, I don't think they have. They... Listen! They... What do you think of that? Oh, I think that's awful. <laughs> you men, your bra, darling. It? Well, I don't wear one. So... It's extraordinary, the ground that she broke down. She was very, very good at uh, talking to ordinary people. Scylla's knack for interacting with the public would never leave her. Have we got any fellas that are willing and able <laughs> for the, the Welsh mob up there? And this never-before-seen footage from a Scylla show outtake is uncannily reminiscent of her future work on Blind Date. Uh, what's your name? Edna. Edna. Edna Powell. Edna, stand up for a minute, look. <laughs> You couldn't show him on the telly, could you? There was just this sense that, you know, everybody really loved her. How do you think of him, Edna? <laughs> Is he all right? You know, she could gently rib somebody without making them feel, you know, singled out in a, in a cruel sense. You know, making the guest feel comfortable was obviously important to her and important to the show. So, um, warm, very, very warm. Despite her warmth and ease on stage, there was an aspect of her physical appearance she wasn't happy with. I think she wants to be that side of camera. Yes. Where's David? And following her one and only acting role on the big screen, the Peter Hall directed Work is a Four Letter Word, Scylla decided to change it. She saw herself on the big screen, which is most of us don't get to do that. And there she was, and saw her nose. She obviously thought, well, I'm a millionaire, you know, I'm 25, I can get this sorted out, and so she did. She said she paid £210 to have it sorted because ever since the age of 13, she'd been rather upset that it had been broken when she'd fallen over in the playground. So to have the opportunity to fix it was wonderful. I tried to keep it secret, but it was the worst thing because it was the staff at the hospital who said, oh, guess who we got? We would have noticed anyway, though, because the nose did change radically. I don't think you did, because my mother was upset. She asked me what I paid for it, and she literally said, you was robbed. <laughs> she was very upset because <laughs> she said, 25, you made your first record at 19, and you've been the biggest thing since sliced bread with the nose that you've got. What do you want to change it all now? Scylla's hard work, perfectionism, and dedication was paying off, and she was also enjoying personal success. Her relationship with partner Bobby, who is now her manager, was stronger than ever. Oh, no, they were rock solid as a couple. I mean, there was no doubt about that. They were childhood sweethearts, and they just loved each other. I mean, she adored him, and he adored her. And he knew, I think, what he had on his hands. He had a huge star. And his joy in life, I think, was making her an even bigger star. On the 25th of January, 1969, the couple married, eight years after starting their romance. Stepping outside after her marriage to her manager, Bobby Willis, the former Priscilla Mary White. You'll recognize her as Scylla Black. The couple hoped to have a church wedding in Liverpool in the spring, but the parish priest is a little put out by the civil ceremony taking place first. Let's hope it all sorts itself out, and they all step inside St Mary's Church in April. <laughs> 
Scylla threw herself into family life. She had a son, Robert, and moved into an eight-bedroom mansion on a 17-acre estate in Denham, Buckinghamshire. But the singing star hadn't given up her professional ambitions. After being voted top female vocalist by NME, in 1973, Scylla released her seventh solo album, which featured what Tim Rice is said to have hailed as the definitive version of Jesus Christ Superstar's I Don't Know How To Love Him. Tim Rice and I were very, very pleased that she covered it. And um, I, as I recall it, it was a really good performance thought through, you know, because a lot of performers, are, you know, will just sing a song. And I, I remember that she really did take the words, because the words tell a very definite thought line. And Silas was certainly one that thought of what Tim Rice was saying. Scylla was now one of the biggest female stars in Britain, but things were about to change. The, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a, a sort of lull. There was a lull? A lull. She was, I remember Scylla. That's what it would be like. But she didn't want to be, I remember Scylla. She wants to be Scylla. By 1983, Scylla was a mum of three, 12-year-old Robert, 8-year-old Ben, and 2-year-old Jack. As she approached 40, television had taken a back seat to motherhood. She retired, I think, almost for about, you know, bringing up her children, because her boys meant everything to her. She was, I remember Scylla. That's what it would be like. But she didn't want to be, I remember Scylla. She wants to be Scylla. In the late 70s and early 80s, there was a, a sort of lull. There was a lull? A lull. There was a lull. I didn't realise there was a lull, actually. I mean, I'd not long given birth to our Jack. It had been seven years since Scylla had presented her own show, and she was no longer the household name she used to be. Good night. God bless. To all then. But the Docker's daughter, who rose to become a star, had an incredible ability to exploit an opportunity. And when she was ready to return, she spotted one. She's got a Greatest Hits album out, so she's going out to promote it, as people do on chat shows. And the big chat show at the time was Wogan. Where else? You'll be seeing a lot more of me this year, because I, so. I was staying at home really purposely with our Jack, because he's only two. He's got bright red hair, but it is as real. Mine came out of a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> It just sort of sparks off, and she becomes this different kind of Scylla. This Scylla that's a bit older and a bit wiser and a bit more circumspect. You know when he was born? When he was born? When old Jack was born? <laughs> I've got a lot to catch up. <laughs> she did Terry Wilkins show and was a huge hit. And then you set off around the country and, and you found yourself in London. The first thing they did to me was throw me in a dirty big posh hotel. Mind you, I thought that was wonderful. I got into this room, you know, and my own black and white telly, you know, my own 14-inch black and white telly, <laughs> and a telephone beside me bed. And I couldn't believe it, you know. I was really over the moon. I picked up this phone, I went to dial, and then I remembered nobody I knew had a phone. <laughs> it was the anecdotes that she told that electrified everyone, people turned to each other and said, where's this woman been? She's fantastic. She's not only a great singer, we know that already. We know she's a really good comedian, but she's a brilliant storyteller. No, I don't know whether you know this, you know, I mean, I've, I've got three lads now and they, were all, they all look different and they were all born different. Our Ben was a breach, he was a difficult... <laughs> The audiences at home weren't the only ones who took notice. TV commissioners, their ears and their eyes pricked up and they said, aha, we might have found a new light entertainment star here. And indeed they had. And everybody wanted her, you know. They, there was a, a battle fighting to get her for Saturday night or Sunday night television. It was like uh, a very desirable footballer. Everyone was bidding 
for Cella, and she indeed, I believe, became the subject of a bidding war between ITV and BBC. Cilla eventually chose ITV as home for the next phase of her career. Her grit, humour and determination had already seen her rise to the top of the pop industry and the variety show world. But for her next move, she would take on a very different role, that of the nation's fairy godmother. Surprise, surprise, it's Cilla Rhea. The essence of Surprise, Surprise was wish fulfilment. You are tonight going to meet the brother who you've never met. Directing the studios for Surprise, Surprise was a really surprisingly emotional experience because a lot of the stories that they told, particularly the closing story to Surprise, Surprise, would always be a very emotional story. Her background as one of us gave Scylla the ability to connect with audiences in a way few others could. It wasn't long before this working class girl from Liverpool was the queen of Sunday night TV, joined by Christopher Biggins. I co-hosted it with her. You know, I think if they'd had someone sophisticated, it would have not worked. We were just ourselves. And how are we this evening? Terrified, Scylla. Yeah. Yes. No, you're not. You weren't shaking. I felt you. Yes. I, felt, I felt your belly. You never should. <laughs> One of the master strokes was getting Christopher Biggins on. A brilliant contrast, which works so well. They're obviously really, really close friends off screen, and their friendship shone through in their on screen partnership. She was very special to me. We were special to each other, I think, you know. It really did feel we were brother and sister. All right. It's the rhinestone cowboy. <laughs> the pair were both equally nervous about how successful Surprise Surprise would be. Even the famously confident Scylla had first night nerves. At the very first recording, she was nervous. I think we were all a bit nervous because we didn't quite know what we had. And this was totally new. I mean, this was, you know, surprising the public. And um, I remember on the first show that we did, it was a huge success. And I said to Scylla and Bobby, I'll see you in the green room with the people who've been taking part in the show. They said, oh, no, 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 we're, we're going out for dinner. You come for dinner with us. I said, we can't leave them. We have to go and say hello because they're the show. They said, no, we've never done that before. I said, well, I'm going to go anyway for five minutes. And they came. And they came for every show for five minutes. I mean, you know, that's the least you can do because they were the public and they were, they, it was, the show was all about them. It was a really uh, pioneering format in that Scylla would introduce a guest onto the stage and surprise them with a guest uh, who was a long lost relative or friend. There was no Facebook. There was no Google. So if you hadn't seen somebody in your family or you'd heard about some long lost family member, um, it took a lot of research and phone calls to put those people together. 130 families were reunited on that show, so it did a phenomenal amount of work. Oh, Christina, will you come and join us, please? We've got our, one of our chaps here to help you down the steps. All right, love? Smash it. The show would surprise us as well as surprise the people who were on it. It's true that you've never, ever seen no. your brother Christopher. No. Is that right? No. Well, you have, you know. Why? Where is he? Well, you know that chap who helped you down the steps? That's your brother Christopher, oh, there he is. <laughs> Bang, one more surprise. There's always room for one more surprise. Scylla was a star and began to behave more and more like one. On the day of the recording, we'd get in about 10 and Scylla would have a glass of champagne. Would I have one? No, I will. I'll wait a little while. <laughs> it's a funny story because at London Weekend Television, Scylla had the star dressing room. And Bobby, her husband, said, look, if Scylla's coming back in September, she's not going to walk down the corridor to the toilet. So you have to make sure that there's a bathroom. We thought it was fantastic because when she wasn't using it, we always got her star dressing room. Stars in those days were very much stars with a capital S. And, and Scylla believed that she was a star too. And I think that's really important. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Scylla Black. The show was notable for its catchy theme tune, written by actress and comedian Kate Robbins. I think 
the reason she chose my song was because when I sent a little demo of the song, just me playing the piano, I did a slight impression of her voice. So I think she heard it and thought, oh, I could sing that, easy, you know. With over 10 million viewers every week, Surprise Surprise was a huge hit, and once again, Scylla was a household name. But she was about to reinvent herself again. She came up with the notion of doing Blind Date because she'd seen it in Australia, on Australian television. She just made it her own. I mean, it was incredible. Blind Date first aired in November 1985 and would run for 18 years. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Blind Date. And here is your host, Priscilla Blind. The genius for her career was a decision by London Weekend to give her Blind Date and let her be herself with her personality and her confidence to chat to people. Oh, please, it's your own bloody fault. Look at the stage. It was a transformation. I suppose to touch the start. <laughs> right. The star can touch you. <laughs> it was perfect for that, because she was cheeky, uh, she was, could be naughty, um, but she was never trashy. And so it was all good, clean fun. It was appointment viewing on a Saturday night. I mean, Scylla fronted two of the biggest shows on television for a very long time because everybody loved watching her. Scylla, with the exception of newsreaders, was now on television more than anyone else. I think the reason for Blind Date's success when it first launched was that there had been nothing like it before. Um, a dating show on TV was a sort of very original idea. Jump on there, Otis! <laughs> oh, I'm sitting on a dock of the bay, I am, I really am, Otis! <laughs> I just turned 21 when I went on the show. I had, I had an absolute blast, a really, really good time. He didn't give me any sort of signals that he, he wanted any romance, <laughs> do you know what I mean? What kind of signal is she after? <laughs> Scylla was great for the show because of her warmth and her ability to make the contestants feel comfortable or uncomfortable. A talent Scylla put to good use when she was tipped off that one of the contestants on her show wasn't all that she seemed to be. I can't imagine anything Paul would hate more than a surprise, yeah. yeah. Well, Nicola, I have to say I've got more than a big surprise for you. Because I know, I know what you're at. And it's, it's, I feel awfully deeply saddened by this, but you don't work as a temporary secretary. I know for a fact that you actually, you're an undercover journalist and you've robbed somebody of coming on a proper blind date. You work for Cosmopolitan magazine. She's a journalist, ladies and gentlemen, not a blind date at all. That was amazing television, wasn't it? I don't think it's the best thing ever. She said, well, I don't think that you're the person you say you are, do you? She said, you're not really. You're not really a contestant, are you? No, because you're a journalist, aren't you? And all the audience go, ooh, it was great, wasn't it? No way you were going to fall in love with him. Tell us the truth. Have you got a boyfriend? No. You haven't. Any children? <laughs> no. <laughs> the audience actually starts booing this contestant, which is remarkable, but it shows that Scylla had them in the palm of her hand. It was her programme, and it was like somebody had come in and, and sort of, I don't know, weed up the wall. And it was, it was wrong, and we were all on her side. When she wasn't weeding out spies, Scylla was truly invested in the romance. On the 24th of September 1988, 23-year-old Alex and 22-year-old Sue met on the show. Before filming even started, Scylla was at pains to put Alex at his ease. She came round to my dressing room and said, listen, there's some fabulous girls waiting for you. They're all going to be marvellous. Just relax, enjoy yourselves. And I think that she was in her makeup and rollers at the time. What about you, number two? What's your name and where do you come from? My name's Sue and I'm from the West Midlands. My main worry when the screen went back that I would be taller than the guy the other side and it's my worst night. So when the screen went back and there was Alex and he was taller than me, so I thought results. That was my first impression, if I'm honest. And of course she was desperate for us to get off. Do I hear yes. wedding bells or do I hear <laughs> ding-a-linging out there? Because you make a lovely couple and thank you both for coming on Blind Date. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex and Sue. Thank you. <laughs> 
Two years later, and just as Scylla had predicted, Alex proposed to Sue, making headlines nationwide. We were the only thing that took the, uh, uh, the Gulf War off, off the, front the front pages page. the following day. Headlines, we were. Alex and Sue's wedding was televised by LWT and 18 million people tuned in to watch, allegedly more than had watched Sarah Ferguson's wedding. I pronounce that they may be man and wife together. And despite her superstar status, Scylla was a suitably understated wedding guest. I mean, obviously everyone knew who she was, um, but it, she didn't take away from me being the star of the show at all. There was plenty of champagne on offer at our wedding, plenty of champagne. So Scylla was well catered for. You've had one wedding, haven't you, in all this one time? Wedding, one wedding, I know. And that was overshadowed by your act. And that was on me. <laughs> Do you look at that? I'm look at that act, I know, what a shame. Actually, you're talking about Ken Dodd, I look like one of the Diddy men. <laughs> we wouldn't have met without Blind Date, without yeah. Scylla. We've been married for almost 30 years now. And uh, we're obviously delighted to have her as our fairy godmother. By the early 90s, Scylla was the highest paid woman on British television. As host of two of the most watched shows on primetime TV, she had become a national icon. They say that the mark of fame is when other people start impersonating you, and by that mark, uh, Scylla was hugely famous. She got her own spitting image puppet. She was also impersonated by famous impressionists of the time like Kate Robbins. Indeed, Kate Robbins even appeared on Harry Enfield's celebrated Scouser sketch as Scylla, as sort of the ultimate representation of the lovable Scouser. Thank you. Oh, good evening and welcome to the show. And we got three lovely fellas lined up behind that screen over there, waiting for some lucky lass to have a date with. But well, let's not hang around. Let's meet them. I love doing Scylla. I noticed that she ran letters together, like, you know, you've got a, got a lot of things to do today, love. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. Which is quite a Liverpool way of saying things, gora, gora. And then I put it into, I, I started saying Laura, Laura this and Laura that, which actually, Scousers don't say. Oh, well, I think they're all gorgeous, but it's not me that has to choose, is it? So come on, Charlotte, which one are you going to choose? Well, I'm sorry. I can't choose any of them. They're all rude, ignorant scousers. Are you saying there's something wrong with coming from Liverpool? <laughs> yes! <laughs> but well, come on, do you want a Kirby kiss or what? <laughs> that was great fun. <laughs> On the floor. All right. <laughs> But impersonating a stalwart of Saturday night can be a risky business when you work in the same building. I was rehearsing in the hallway before I went on Saturday Live with the, the orange short-haired wig. And I was, you know, going, oh, hey, you're lovely. Oh, Laura this, Laura that. And I remember she was in the same ITV studios making Surprise, Surprise. And she walked past and said, hey, is that you, Kate? And she was looking at me sort of, what are you doing, Kate? You know, and I said, Oh, nothing, I'm just doing a sketch. And she said, oh, I'll see you later. So that was the degree to which he penetrated the national consciousness. Every playground in Britain during that period was echoing to the sounds of, it's a Laura, Laura laughs, and that would be said with a much better Scouse accent, by the way. All those things that she said that became part of the national vocabulary are a testament to her huge stature as a star. Scylla had an amazing talent for bringing a smile to the faces of her audiences. But her ability to keep entertaining was about to face a serious challenge. She'd lost everything. She sold over 10 million records and still owes the record for the top-selling single by a British female artist. She's been on more blind dates than anyone in the country, and she's currently celebrating 30 years in show business with a new album, Through the Years. Ladies and gentlemen, who else but Scylla Black? In the mid-90s, as Scylla basked in the glow of three decades at the top of UK entertainment, by her side, as he had been from the start, was her devoted manager and husband, Bobby. It's very difficult in, in, in show business being married to a megastar. I mean, do, is it difficult? No, no. Do you not <laughs> mind being Mr. Scylla Black? I don't know anything else. <laughs> Bobby really, really looked after Scylla. And of course, he was the love of her life, and she is. They were an absolute team. I always tell the story that you would be rehearsing the show in, 
London Weekend Television Studio One, and he would always sit in the middle of the audience. And he had a very refined sense of what would Scylla, what would Scylla say. And if she was asked to say anything or change words or whatever that hadn't been agreed, you could see her imperceptibly look up at Bobby and he would equally imperceptibly either shake his head or nod. And that's, and she would do. She always had that voice right behind her, always supporting her and always protecting her. I was really impressed by that and I thought that Scylla was lucky in a way to have somebody who loved her so much, who kept an eye on her in everything that she did. Wherever Scylla was, Bobby was there. He was the perfect manager, you know, he was the best personal manager. Nobody knew Scylla like he did. But in 1999, Bobby was diagnosed with cancer. It was devastating. And for the first time in over 30 years, Scylla had to contemplate a life without him by her side. When Bobby was dying, um, I used to go out and visit and at the house, and it was, it was really sad because she knew, the boys knew, and I think he knew. On October 23rd, 1999, Bobby Willis passed away. He was 57. It was tragic, and not only had she lost a, a husband, a lover, her best friend, she'd lost everything, and he did everything for her. I remember the night he died, she rang me in tears saying, I don't know what to do with the dogs, because he did everything. A devastated Scylla went back to work just two weeks later. We were doing the first episode of the series following Bobby's death, and she was obviously very, very nervous about it. She would always come on and do a little bit with the audience before we started taping the show. And Graham Skidmore, the, the voiceover, would say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scylla Black, and she would come on. And at that point, the audience went completely wild and stood up and applauded. And I think it must have touched her enormously. If I hadn't have gone back when I did, I would never, ever have done it. I'm glad I did, because at the end of the day, my work has been my lifesaver. It's been fabulous. Yes. Now, leaning on her close friends more than ever, Scylla spent more time with her inner circle. There were three of us. There was Paul O'Grady. Dale Winton, and the, we were her, her gay boys. And uh, she, you know, we, we looked after her. I mean, she was at a loss. She was a sad soul. I mean, you know, and her very close friends knew that. And she, she you know, we, we, we did try and do everything we could. And we did, and it was, wasn't a chore because we loved her. Even without Bobby, Scylla maintained her ability to spot a new opportunity and her performance at the London Palladium revealed a fresh side to her. I think it became iconic because it was a new chapter in her life that was perhaps going to be a bit more exciting, and that was almost the beginning of it. It was sort of two years after her husband died, Bobby, um, and obviously that was really a rough time for her, and I think she decided that this probably was going to be um, going to be a moment that she could show people that she was the, a new Scylla, if you like. So I set about doing some drawings for her for this costume, and then I showed it to her, um, and she absolutely loved it. Um, so she was really up for it, which surprised me in a way, because she often didn't like showing too much flesh. One of the campiest moments in the whole of showbiz history was when Scylla teamed up with Barbara Windsor and Paula Grady to perform You Gotta Have a Gimmick from Gypsy in the 2001 Royal Variety Show. I laughed out loud when she switched on her gimmick and she had her heart-shaped thing covering her bits. And I just thought it was such a clever idea. And boy, could she pull it off because she had fabulous legs. She looked amazing. Oh.
There was an enormous roar from the audience when she came out, and I think the audience loved it. Oh, it was sensational. It was a superb piece of casting. It's one of those prize moments that you never forget. We went for the first rehearsal. They closed, they finished the rehearsal, then closed the auditorium because they wanted to keep it secret. So it was a shock and a wonderful surprise to all of us who'd been watching rehearsals and, and people who'd just been enjoying the show, never expecting Scylla for one minute to come out and do the switching and light up the way she did. But then, in a weird way, she always lit up the stage anyway, but that was just an extra bounce of light that night. <laughs> She certainly threw herself into it and I, as I say I was surprised because her legs she wanted out and she wanted the leg line higher and higher. Took a lot of people aback, I mean demure, lovable, uh, nation's favourite auntie playing a stripper but that's typical of Scylla to do something slightly unexpected, slightly off the wall, keep them guessing and that's one of the reasons why her career lasted so long. I need the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd. I love live audiences. It's great to get out the studios and actually appear in a theatre with people. They've actually paid to come and see you. I think that's incredible. Scylla was always in control of her career, and this was never more evident than in 2003, when she walked on stage for the 18th series of her most beloved show. I love directing live shows. So whenever something unusual happens, you're kind of prepared for it. Um, but it was just so unlike her. But if you ask me honestly, there was definitely a twinkle in her eye when she started the show. Scylla made her usual fantastic entrance down a staircase um, and said hello and welcome. And then she went off script. Hello. Welcome to this very special live show and you know what ladies and gentlemen it is a very special live show because this is going to be my very very last series of blind dates <gasps> you couldn't believe i would never seen anybody do that before the first and last time it was ever live uh, was when Scylla surprised everyone and by that I really too mean everyone me, the producers, the ITV executives. The way Scylla Black resigned on air was an absolute masterstroke. I think the whole of Britain was shocked. And there was literally silence in the control room. Not many people would dare to do that these days, I don't think. These days they'd make a TikTok first, wouldn't they? I thought that was a very classy thing to do, really. Dale Winton, one of her very close friends, always used to say, don't quit the hit. If you're in the biggest show on telly, it takes a lot of bottle and a lot of courage to say, no, I'm stepping away. It was very carefully planned, because I said to Robert and my dear daughter-in-law, Fiona, um, if I was going to do, make this, this announcement, I have to do it in the first 10 minutes of the show. If I don't do it in the yeah. first 10 minutes, yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. And literally, I hadn't made up my mind until I heard uh, the opening bars of the music. Da-da, da-da, I went. I turned round to my producer. I may go off on a tangent here, but don't worry, I'll come back. <laughs> I think she went at the right time because the ratings were sliding a bit. Uh, they were trying to introduce different bits of the format, which I don't think she approved of. And had Bobby been alive, I think they would have sat on them quite quickly. But I think without Bobby there, she felt a bit more vulnerable. And I think it was just the right time to get out. Scylla had made a shrewd decision, as she'd done so many times throughout her long career. And when she made her final exit, the public would be there to wave her off. There was her public, you know, right to the end.
After a career of over 40 years, having now stepped away from presenting, Scylla found herself spending more time at the family home in Denham. Denham was, a, was very much her main home and she loved it. It was very family orientated, animals. And there were amazing things in it. You know, she had Lowry paintings, she had Clarice Cliff ceramics, she had beautiful things and she was surrounded by beautiful things. The most hysterical things was in her drawing room. The television was a globe and she loved it because it was very period. But it was a terrible thing to watch television on. It was done so that she cr could create this amazing environment. It was a very personal, private place, I think, for her. And unusually for a star of her standing, Scylla had a lifelong, very unshowbiz hobby. She loved cleaning. I mean, you know, you could put her in a, a, a pair of marigolds and she was as happy as anything. And it was always immaculate. When you, I mean, yes, it was a family home, but it was an immaculate family home. <laughs> But even in semi-retirement, Scylla remained a sought-after chat show guest, starting to reach a new, younger audience. Appearing on comedian Jack Whitehall's show, aged 71, she'd lost none of her humour or fight. She was a wonderful guest on chat shows because she was so naturally humorous. I do this occasionally because I'm a fan of yours. Oh, I'm a big you. fan. Not oh. of yours. <laughs> <laughs> You said about Liverpool. It's so funny and it's so fast and it's so Scylla. It was nice to see Scylla on, on the Jack Whitehall programme that he does with his dad. And it, he was treated as a naughty schoolboy, which is what he is. And, uh, you know, so when she, when she slapped him down in the nicest possible way, it's because she's Scylla Black. <laughs> she's, she's not here uh, to not be the centre of attention. But she does it in, with such grace and humour as well. I had him coming in once. That was the no. worst. I had a girl in my bed and he came in. He didn't know I'd brought the a girl threesome. back. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yet again, Scylla had stolen the show. So it was a shock to everyone when it turned out to be her last television interview. Behind the scenes, her health was starting to decline. Six months later, on the 1st of August 2015, Scylla died following a fall at her home in Spain. She was just 72. I've been doing exactly what I wanted, wanted to do all my life. When I heard that Scylla had passed away, I was absolutely gutted, surprised, and she still seems so young. Thank you very much, and to all them. I was absolutely shocked beyond my core. Hundreds of people have lined the streets of Liverpool to say farewell to Scylla Black. She was an, a national institution, and to just suddenly go so quickly. I'm just so grateful that she allowed me into a whirlwind of a life, and we spent nearly two decades together hell-raising, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> well, when Scylla passed on, uh, it was a great loss. It was a ruddy great hole in British entertainment. I would have loved to have worked with her, but of course never did. But I was lucky to know her. At her funeral, it was quite extraordinary because the streets of Liverpool were lined with people. You know, were obviously upset that why we were there. And then we started to laugh and laugh and laugh because we kept telling stories about her. I remember losing her keys and getting wedged in a window in Barbados with me holding her ankles. <laughs> And when the neighbours came out, she shouted, surprise, surprise! <laughs> but it was a wonderful moment to have reminiscing and laughing, which, of course, she would have loved. I miss bumping into Scylla, whether it was, you know, at an opening night or, or whether it's just at somebody's party. After a lifetime in the spotlight, it was perhaps no surprise that the public wanted to be there to say goodbye. And I remember when we went to the cemetery to bury her, a lot of the public were there, which was amazing. They found out, because it was supposed to be a secret, they found out where she was going to be buried. There must have been a thousand people there. And when the body was put into the earth, and we were all feeling, you know, numb with horror, really, they all burst into spontaneous applause. And it was, it was really rather wonderful that there was her public, you know, right to the end. Even after her death, 
Scylla's story continues with a musical about her life opening in 2017. Scylla would be thrilled to think that there was a musical the next stage and um, even though she never saw it, Scylla the musical, I think, I think she'd be absolutely made up, dead made up. I can just see Scylla though sitting in the West End watching a musical about her own life and maybe jumping up at one stage and saying, that's not how it was, I'll tell the story. I was lucky enough to play her in uh, Scylla the Musical uh, a couple of years ago, which was an incredible thing, and to play a part like that and to play a part that the audience so clearly love. Everyone was on their feet and I think my jaw just fell and I was like, oh my God. And I mean, it makes me quite like, I feel a bit funny and emotional now talking about it. After five decades as one of Britain's most successful female performers, it will be hard to forget the entertainer so famous she was known by her first name, Scylla. I think anybody who lived through her period of life, uh, they will always remember the music, they will always remember the humour, they will always remember, and certainly I will, the way she treated the public, the way the public loved her, and that ordinary, down-to-earth, Liverpool attitude. I think Scylla would want us to have a drink and a laugh, remembering her always. You've been ever such a lovely audience, and I'd just like to say thank you very much, and please come again. Good night. Tra! <laughs> An 81-year-old who's accidentally double-dosed on his prescription meds is just one of the patients where every second counts in new series Casualty 24-7 Wednesday at 9. Next tonight, the story of one of Scylla's best friends, a working-class Merseysider who found fame as a glamorous entertainer, Paula Grady, 25 years of sweet and savage. <laughs>